This is the time that smart guy tried to be in a Destiny's Child music video. TJ Henderson walks into an audition to become a background dancer for Destiny's Child. He read in Sister Girl magazine that Destiny's Child is really involved in the entire process, so he's hoping to meet him. He runs up on Miguel thinking that he's Beyonce, so apparently TJ is not a very smart guy. Essence Atkins tells him that the Shade Room is not a reputable news source and only simpletons would fall for that. Right on cue, Jason Weaver and Omar Gooding walk in and the director picks them and TJ to audition for backup dancers. Now this is pre-baby boy Omar Gooding, so him and Jason Gooding try the thriller dance and TJ Henderson tries the Ben Vereen. It turns out that TJ really is a smart guy because Destiny's Child was watching behind some one-way glass. They really must not be Michael Jackson fans, I'm guessing, because they say hell not to the thriller dance. They really love TJ, so now he's the main and only focus of their video. Essence Atkins, who has just proven wrong as hell, is furious. TJ is super Hollywood, standing by the craft table, name dropping before he gets called on to act. Jason Weaver got the backstage pass, but the security guard stops Omar Gooding expeditiously. Jason goes on and immediately tries to holler at Beyonce, which is a pretty legendary move right there. He's trying to get in early. She says that it was nice meeting him, so he takes that as an in. Weaver now I guess has pull in these streets, so he gets Omar Epps immediately in. Jason was supposed to give Beyonce say their mixtape but Omar never actually gave it to him in the first place so they shoot the entire music video in one take and TJ is in this young ass wave cap looking like a black Israelite now I don't really know shit about tap dancing but I've seen plenty of sea walking I feel like TJ skip skip might not be that sturdy the music video turns off and Destiny Childs is actually debuting the video at TJ's house they have some exciting news they want TJ to tour America and Europe for the next six months and do that routine on stage every night the dad it is lame as hell so he says that they need to talk about it before immediately jumping in on it without thinking at all tj invites the children of destiny to dinner and to work on the dad and they happen to love home cooked meals so they say yeah they start talking about texas a bunch but that's just literally being around anyone from texas for more than five minutes jason weaver omar gooding and beyonce return from the store which is a sentence i never actually thought that i would say where i guess jason assaulted a girl scout for asking beyonce if she wanted cookies omar's acting weird and i think he passes jason a bag of some reggie jason's weaver is trying not to holler too hard you know trying to play coy but beyonce is starting to give him a little play she says she feels so comfortable around him and she hates how everyone is always just trying to use her. Even her own grandma sent her a demo tape. That is right when Jason's about to pass her the mixtape, so he just decides not to do that. Smart move. Instead, he asks her to go to the dance with him. While I am disgusted by the lack of hustle, I definitely respect the game. One hater though is Omar Epps, who is mad that he didn't give his mixtape to Beyonce. But he goes and bags Latoya, so he ain't too mad. Smart guy then pulls Lativia and Kelly, so clearly he is a very smart guy. Even though I doubt it a bit because he's dressed like he's gonna baptize him for the dance. TJ tries to press his dad real quick about letting him be rich and famous and go on tour, but his dad is telling him that he really doesn't want these problems. TJ says Michael Jackson did it and he turned out fine, and the dad says that he's a special exception. The girls arrive and TJ is acting like a baby. At the dance, TJ is getting turned up on Fruit Punch and just ruining the dance for Lativia and Kelly. This shit must be fermented. Omar Epps is teaching LaToya and the studio audience about Washington, D.C. I learned today that apparently it's just Maine for black people. While Jason Weaver is dancing and holding his breath being so close to Beyonce, he's interrupted by some goofy ass dude asking them if Destiny's Child will sing a song. They enthusiastically go up mostly because they don't want to hear smart guy complaining no more. Jason Weaver says he can save her. But Beyonce says, thanks, but I'm good. They sing a nice copyright free Amazing Grace, which I could probably actually show, but I'm definitely not going to because Disney would definitely get me the hell up out of here. The whole time, Beyonce is singing all over everyone else, which is kind of rude, but also foreshadowing. The crowd goes crazy. Omar Gooding gives Latoya a mixtape in a jewelry box. That's offensive as hell to do mid-dance, so Latoya throws liquor in his face, which is probably the correct response. TJ arrives home still acting like a brat, and his dad wants to talk. But TJ warns him that he's got a gut full of punch and he might say anything. His dad goes to bed and warns him not to push his luck. Jason Weaver comes home with Beyonce. I mean, let's have a moment of praise for that, am I right? 
She's complaining about how rough being on the road is and TJ is just being nosy. Even Jason Weaver says that shit sounds rough. He offers to save her once again. She can come live with him and be his girlfriend. She says, nah, she has a Mercedes convertible and a three bedroom house. Even Jason Weaver agrees that that sounds better. TJ's dad hates going to bed upset, so he goes in to talk to TJ. He tells him that he's doing it for TJ's well being, but TJ says that he's good on going on tour anyways. He was ear hustling on Beyonce, talking about how tough it was and how he would rather just be a kid, and the dad is jealous that he couldn't verbalize it in that way. TJ tells him it's because he's never lived that life, so how could he? Jason Weaver and Omar Gooding are watching a war show and Beyonce and Usher sitting together. Jason Weaver is mad, which fair, you lost Beyonce, but he realizes that he got to go get some paper if you want to get her back. That's a real hustler right there. I want to dedicate this hip to Steve Harvey. Okay, now that there was a little history. We begin with everyone's high school teacher and musical legend Steve Hightower and his patented silk press and 10 button suit, teaching the kids about the history of musical theater. They don't want to talk about that boring stuff. They want to talk about how Mr. Hightower went viral recently. Sean Puff P. Dude Love Daddy Diddy Combs wants to sample his song, but Steve says, eh, 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 take that, take that, to that convo. At that moment, Snoop Doggy Lion Doggy Dog walks in to sell some weed or something, but Steve says later he's at work. It's later and Steve is reading the wrong answers on the test out loud to all the kids, which seems kind of like a crazy thing to do as a teacher, but it's pretty swaggy. I mean, just because. Regina walks in and asks Steve to come play music at her parents' 40th wedding anniversary. Steve tries to get some buns or some funds, but ends up with none. They go and pick her parents up from the airport and her dad is a one percenter. He's wondering where the Black Jesus and Martin Luther King pictures are, which I was wondering the same. He lives in Arizona, so that's kind of confusing. He hates it. He especially hates Steve because he used to make inflammatory songs about their daughter before she lost a bunch of weight. Regina breaks them up right before Steve gets his ass beat. Regina's mom is ready to go make some fried chicken because Regina is just too skinny. People have been saying she's been doing her best Pookie impersonation because of her sudden weight loss. The next day at school, Puffy walks in on Cedric and Steve Hightower and says start standing. Cedric would eventually let them talk in private, but as he's leaving, he sees Snoop Dogg walk in. In order to prevent more East Coast, West Coast chicanery, he starts freestyling at Snoop to distract him from going in. That doesn't work, and he's pretty whack. Snoop and Puffy meet eyes in the room and there is a palpable tension. Most of the tension comes from Steve going on a long-winded speech about black history, but not like actual black history, just some random words to try to distract everyone and ease the situation. Snoop and Puff tell him that he's an old man and that he doesn't understand the youth and all that rivalry is just media hype. Steve asks them to come in and talk to his class the next day. They're back at Regina's apartment and Steve is trying to figure out what song to play at the wedding. The arguments are starting fast and early, so Steve offers to throw the father Linwood a bachelor party. This obviously causes a bigger argument. Linwood talks about how much he hates Arizona. They were the last state to implement Martin Luther King Day. He talks about how there's only four black people, so it's impossible to get a proper fade or a good game of bid whist or some good catfish or a wing spot. This is a super accurate depiction of Arizona. He takes Steve hostage and they're out on a night of nothing at all on the town. I mean, they have nothing planned. Steve blew all that musical legend money long ago. So this is going to be probably a pretty lame night. The next day of school, Snoop and Diddy go do a PSA, but also really don't say anything. Just eh -eh, and take that, take that and faux shizzle or whatever is going on in the 90s. The studio audience is going crazy. The kids in the class though, look like nothing at all was said to them. Diddy and Snoop get a lower bid on a sample so they do not need Steve no more. So Steve starts to threaten violence on the person getting paid. I know Linwood wouldn't be happy to see Steve acting like this to another black man. The wedding of Linwood and Coretta is today and she is refusing to marry him. Steve lies to Linwood and says that Coretta was maimed to get him to come and no one in the room is happy right now. Steve tells him that he needs to start copping please because once every woman in your life is mad at you, you know that you have gone too far. He thinks of the best way to say that it really is all his fault. So he says that she's the activator and the jerry curl of love. That clearly and obviously works and she comes out. They go in the back and they consummate the marriage for about 10 minutes and then they 
actually do the real marriage. At the reception, it's still season one, so Cedric has not met Levita Alize Jenkins. So he walks over to this beautiful black queen and lets her know that women over the age of 35 need to take what they can get. So hello, my name is Cedric. She walks directly away. Do not say that line. It's time to toss the bouquet and in the ensuing struggle, Steve ends up with it. He tosses it back and Regina catches it. I'm not too, too sure how this works. So I'm guessing nobody is getting married anytime soon. We begin today's tale with Jamie, Fancy and Braxton walking in and Jamie has a giant bucket of popcorn, which he said he got for $17, which with inflation is a cool 50 now. Fancy is thirsting over Wesley Snipes and Jamie is hating, of course, because I think he got turned down for Blade, maybe. Jamie tells everyone that he's gonna be a star. They all tell him he need to get up, get out and get some. You can't spend all your life trying to get by. We can't just wait for life to come to us. Right at this moment, life just comes to Jamie and some random director, Ike Yi, walks in and he wants to shoot a movie in the hotel. Goes to show you, you can't just follow anyone's advice. Aunt Helen's over there hating and saying, they aren't doing a movie here because she doesn't want to destroy the hotel. Ike offers 10 racks, so Junior just passes him a hammer. Jamie is feeling beautiful, so he throws his set up. Helen mentions how he doesn't even have a role. Jamie auditions on the spot and he does a creepy ass Hannibal Lecter impersonation and the director tells him that he stinks. He does need the hotel though, so he writes Jamie in for something. In preparation for his Hollywood debut, Jamie goes up and puts on his best Hawaiian shirt. He goes directly to The Rock's black half brother and he's acting green. He starts harassing uh, Dwayne Johnson, so he has to call security. Jackie Chin walks in and I just wanna reiterate, I'm not the one who's saying this joke. This is the Jamie Foxx show. Jackie Chin walks in and he wants everyone to know who this clown riding his dick is. Ike Yee. You know what? Matter of fact, I want to say that too. I, I'm not making up that name either. Ike, Ike Yee with the Y on his shirt. Hilarious. It's a great director. So he tries to tell Jamie that he needs to stand in the background and act like he isn't even there. It is now time for the scene. Jackie is checking into the hotel for a martial arts tournament. Jamie must hand him a key and say nothing. Jamie has the most important role not ruining the movie. Director calls action and Jamie starts yelling obscenities, which isn't Ike Yee's favorite. This script isn't Jamie's favorite. He has plenty ideas for rewrites, but this hater won't budge. While Jamie is out for lunch, they try to shoot the scenes as fast as possible before he gets back. While Jackie Chin is searching the couch for the keys, Jamie pops up like a jack-o'-lantern from the couch, which is weird because how long have you been inside of that couch? Now, uh, Dwayne Johnson is is trying to holler at Fancy and he talks about being a stuntman. That's gonna be really useful because he is crashing and burning right now. It's time for a scene and as he is lining up, getting ready to go, Jamie knocks him the hell out with the door. Now they really have a big problem. Jackie needs someone he can break their legs, snap their neck and crush their skull. For once, Jamie may well be qualified for a role. Ike is searching for Jamie so they can shoot the next scene. Helen tells him that he'll be here. He's probably just studying. It turns out that Jamie has been studying the book If I Did It because he walks in with three white girls, a pair of isotoners, and one black girl just so he lets everyone know that he's still down. Keep in mind, this man is a random extra and he shows up 30 minutes late with sunglasses and no wardrobe with an entourage. He's acting like an asshole to every hotel employee and he's feeling like a star. It's time for action and to let Jamie really be a star. All he has to do is pull his gun, say his line, and start shooting. Simple. Jackie's job is simple as well, as he straight assaults Jamie and yeets his ass across the room. Now that's what I call a rehearsal. Jamie starts talking to ghosts, so he might be dealing with a different type of white girl, if you know what I'm saying. It's time for his next scene, and Jamie reminds everyone that he's Jamie King, not Rodney King. The director yells, world star, and Jamie starts whooping ass. He has Jackie Chin laid the hell out. Finally, one from my boy, Atmosphere. That, that's his nickname, Atmosphere. You never celebrate early, which Jamie finds out as Jackie cracks him over the head with a bottle like Cameron in Killer Season, and he performs a fatality, fatality on him. He even manages to beat someone else's ass using only Jamie's ass. Jamie really is a natural for this thing. The whole family wants him to stop, 
The director does too, but he paid for all day at this dump, so he has two more hours to shoot this. Helen and Baxter try to jump Jackie and Ike, and Jamie tries to tell everybody to chill out. He'll take care of this. It's time for the final scene. This is the climax of the movie, as they so eloquently remind us. Jackie creeps through the door, and he's mad as hell. Jamie took his wife and his money and damn it, he needs his paper. Jamie starts talking crazy and starts perfectly countering Jackie. He then brutally executes Jackie and throws him into a piano. He makes a couple of racial remarks and Ike leaves. The next day, Jamie is feeling a little beat up and he has learned his lesson. He'll never treat his people like that again. Fancy ass if his movie career is over, which is a gross overstatement for his acting. Braxton comes in and apparently they're shooting set it off and Jamie goes running. They're not actually shooting set it off if you couldn't guess. We begin with a picture of Dr. Carter G. Woodson on the chalkboard. The teacher is talking about his 1926 formation of Negro History Week. In February 1976, Negro History Week became Black History Month. Penny is one of those millennial types, so she tries to tell him that he means African American. He lets her know that Negro was one of the best words they could have called us back then. Dijanae wants to know if we can go back to a week because these lessons are boring. I think the teacher starts passing out copies of the Watchtower or something. The kids don't want to keep talking about this over and over again. It's the 21st century. We're all hip hop. Racism is over. He gives them all an assignment on black history. They have to play dress up and read a small bio on a civil rights icon of the teacher's choosing. All by tomorrow. These teachers honestly be doing the most and this really kind of might be why the kids hate black history. Penny got the author and activist Angela Davis and has no idea who that is. Dijanae got the first black woman to become a pilot, Bessie Coleman, and has no idea who that is. La Cienega got the first black congresswoman, Shirley Chisholm, and has no idea who she is, but she's pretty sure she would have had a miniskirt. Sticky got former guest star of Girlfriends and My Wife and Kids, Al Sharpton, but... They don't specify which size of owl they want. Zoe has Madam CJ Walker, so she got to get a high comb run through that straight hair. Just at that moment, the janitor starts getting all butthurt because the kids are walking through the wet floor sign, but the kids are the millennial type, so they lie about their names and they run the hell off. Oscar is dressed up like he's going to the premiere of Black Panther. He says that he's having a LeVar Burton film festival, which might be the funniest joke I've heard. Penny walks in with her natural and starts regurgitating facts about Angela Davis. She's really black power now. Dijanae asks if she's Macy Gray, which is probably the second funniest joke I heard. La Cienega starts disrespecting respecting black women's hair, not cool. Zoe walks up and I think she's dressed like Harry Styles. The girls start going in on her and honestly, if it weren't so funny by itself, I probably would be too. Penny is dropping Puff off now at the groomers, but she gets sent back to the civil rights era by a tornado? Even in the 1950s, she getting roasted. Some things just never change. In the 1950s, the history teacher is now a slappy type janitor. They got him talking like Chicken George. Penny tries to talk to Zoe, but she's of the superior Caucasian race, so all the white girls start screaming about how they don't talk to color people, and her black ass needs to leave Zoe alone. Disney is officially off their rocker at this point, and Penny really does not understand this whole segregation thing just yet. It's time for class and Penny is late. The white janitor is now the teacher and Penny is still oblivious of anything going on. She doesn't pick up on social cues at all. All the Negro kids in the back of the class with the old textbooks want to know why she keeps calling everybody black. The teacher tells her that there is no such thing as Black History Month or even Negro History Month because there is no such thing as black history. She gets up and starts talking about a bunch of black feats, but none of that shit happened yet, so they just laugh at her. Penny arrives home and Oscar just invented potato chips. Penny disregards the great black inventor, which kind of makes her a hypocrite. She has to go wash dishes now, and she keeps calling people black, so Oscar lets her know that we don't use that word in this house. He then tells her it's 1955. She really just figured this out, which kind of shows a real lack of awareness. The next morning, she's walking to school with Sticky and explaining her predicament. He's looking at her with bewilderment, which is kind of fair because she sounds crazy. They see Zoe crying, so Penny crosses the color line and she asks what's wrong. Zoe's bird is dying, and 
and Penny offers to take it to her mom. Zoe is shocked. A colored veterinarian? Penny corrects her. Watch your damn mouth, white girl. What an activist. I should probably say that's really not what she said, but if this were my show and it was on HBO, that's what she would say. When they get to Dr. Proud's office, Trudy is shocked to see this alabaster adolescence in her domicile, but is willing to help. The Hippocratic Oath or some shit like that. Mr. Proud is not so happy about this. He tries to pull Penny out to slur at Zoe, but he accidentally pulls Zoe out. Penny tells him that he's ignorant. Oscar tells Trudy that she's gonna get the house burned down. Upstairs, Penny is playing with the children while Zoe is trying not to get too many colored germs on her clothes. Seriously though, they say colors so much in this episode, it's pretty jarring to hear that on top of an animated Disney show. It's not just me screaming obscenities. Penny really asks Zoe why the schools are separated. And she says that's just how things are. Penny tells her that the future is near and those white tears will be the fuel for the revolution. Zoe tells her that that's woke nonsense and I really doubt it. Zoe does have the courage to touch a black baby now though. Dr. Proud even managed to save the bird and Zoe hugs a black person. It may be because Trudy is light-skinned, but progress is progress. The next day at school, Zoe and Penny sit right next to each other in class and attempt to rally the segregated room. The teacher walks in and spits his coffee out at the race swapping. He tries to kick the race traders out of his room. All the kids join hands in unison and have a sit-in. Penny is really starting the civil rights movement right now. Skinny gets his guitar out and he does his best King of Rock impersonation, you know, Chuck Berry. They walk outside to an angry mob protesting their integration. Disney is woker than caffeine at this point. They are so woke that they basically sleep because they have a bunch of black people with no integration signs. I have been looking at Little Rock 6 pictures and videos for 10 minutes and I still have not found those pictures. I'm sure they exist, but I didn't find them. And I damn Disney for making me start my morning Googling that. Penny gets the crowd's attention and she steals the I have a dream speech, which is really going to destroy this timeline because now it'll be attributed to her. The power of Dr. King even has Puff down with the swirl. Penny wakes up and I guess she was in a coma. She gets up and starts talking about she had a dream, how all y'all were oppressed, which is a really weird flex, but okay. Everyone except Zoe, of course. She's glad she's back to modern times where that ain't true no more. For punishment for running through the halls, they have to mop the floors. And Sicky talks about how it's 1950s all over again. Due to white guilt, the janitor takes the kids out to ice cream. Life imitates art, so as in real life, it is Black History Month in that so Raven. They are making soul food to commemorate. Fried chicken, collard greens, candy yams, and cornbread. Corey is in the house and he wants pizza. He's really over this black history stuff and just wants to keep it at school. His parents are disappointed and they want him to stop bending to the oppression of the man. Raven comes down and she's on her way to the mall to apply to her favorite store, Sassy's. They're at Sassy's, filling out their applications, and this girl Chelsea is useless. Super kind of ditzy and just clearly incompetent. Raven literally designs clothes, so I mean, she's probably infinitely more qualified already. They begin a series of tests, and Raven folds Chelsea on the folding test. They now have to style a customer, and Raven dresses her up like Lois from Malcolm in the Middle, and she absolutely loves it. Chelsea styles hers like Harry Styles, and everyone hates it. Corey's in the house and he's playing the original Xbox with this Mad Cats controller. I'm, I'm actually joking. I looked this up and apparently this is one of the like rare Xbox original controllers. So hopefully Corey still got that. His dad walks in wondering what happened to that paper he had to write. Corey tells him he's done and he shows him the paper. At that moment, his father and Dr. Umar are not proud. Corey is not upholding himself as a strong and proud black man. Corey's dad sits him down and tells him that when he was a kid a long ass time ago, they didn't even teach black history in school. Corey reluctantly agrees to really buckle down and finish his assignment. The next day at school, Orlando Brown is trying to achieve Dr. King's dream by how and got every race of girl in the school. He's tricking and offering girls discounts to Sazzy's. They ain't even got the job yet, by the way. Right at that moment, Chelsea walks up and she's on the phone with Sassy. And she actually has the job now. Everyone's celebrating like black aunties at graduation. She then asks about Raven and Raven did not get the job at all. Just at that moment, 
the magical black person uses her psychic powers to out Miss Sassy as a racist. That goes to show the only way we can fight racism is by banding together and using our psychic powers to figure out which races are around us. Get like a Cerebro for racist. When they get home, they're all still in shock. And Orlando Brown asks if they've ever seen any people of color work at Sassy's. Orlando Brown then tells a story about a friend he had as a kid whose dad ran up and snatched him up because he was playing with Orlando Brown. All because he was black. That day changed him forever. Well, Chelsea is off to work now. Her only friends, which are all black, are confused. She then tells him that she's going to quit. Then I think she bumps her knee or something because she starts walking funny. Corey is in the house, upstairs, bored as hell, trying to write this black history paper. He starts disassociating and frederick Douglass starts talking to him through his computer screen he then literally exits the screen and grows his body to 500 times its size i tried to tell y'all all black people have superpowers frederick Douglass is disappointed at cory for his lack of black power bessie coleman walks in and cory is bewildered at this point scott joplin is downstairs playing ragtime and cory said that shit was light frederick Douglass starts disintegrating objects to the Prove to Corey that he better respect his power. His black power. Then they start showing him all the black people. All the inventors that they mentioned in the Proud Family episode. Along with Harriet Tubman. Jackie Robinson. Thurgood Marshall. And all your other favorite black people. They even get a uh, treach from Naughty by Nature. Corey wakes up from his K-hole with a newfounded excitement for civil rights. Downstairs, Raven is watching the uh, Honorable Elijah Muhammad on TV when her parents walk in the room she tells them that she didn't get the job at sassy's and it's because she's black her dad is ready to march on washington but her mom reminds her how stupid it is that her only evidence is literally psychic powers raven wants to give up but her parents give her the encouragement to fight the power raven has an idea and she calls chelsea before she quits this light-skinned news anchor is here to help and they give Chelsea this ugly ass hat that has a camera in it, directly outside of the store that Miss Sassy's standing in. She proceeds to do a terrible job keeping Miss Sassy in frame. Raven comes in dressed like Morgan Freeman and Lean On Me, and Miss Sassy tells Chelsea to go watch him. Chelsea does the most, and Miss Sassy picks up the snitching task. Raven says she's the president of the company, and Miss Sassy starts copping, please. Raven asks if she hires any black people, and she says she saw a young color girl apply yesterday. Miss Sassy tries to call her right now and Raven has to throw her phone to hide the ringing. Orlando Brown got hit with the phone and has a concussion now and when he comes in to give it back he also asks for an application. Right after Miss Sassy immediately turns around to the nearest white person and starts being racist, Miss Sassy doesn't hire black people. Thanks to Miss Lightskin Reporter, we fucking got him. Miss Sassy's racist ass on the Summer Jam screen now. Racism over. Right after they get some celebratory soul food, which I mean, I definitely feel that, they also get some ice cream, which of course was invented by Sam Jackson, a black man. They begin with the morning prayer. Curtis prays to remove the freeloaders from his house. Curtis is a heathen, so God doesn't grant that for him. Calvin walks in the house all spry and starts trying to eat some raw eggs like Rocky. Curtis tells him he's gonna get salamander poisoning. He's a pretty good father. Calvin's about to hurl and then he asks Ella if she could fry these up. She is in the middle of breakfast and he just ran in here like Urkel and demanded she stop and cook him some eggs when she just got done cooking for everybody. He's literally the Christian version of baby boy. Calvin reveals he met a girl and he's training to run a 25k with her and he thinks that it's too 2.5 miles Malik tells him that it's 15 miles and he might be a mad savant because he did that in his head super fast Curtis really needs a reimbursement on Calvin's education Ella gets jump scared by Janine just in case y'all don't know Janine is a crack addict and the maternal figure for the freeloaders she recently dipped out of rehab, wasted their money, then robbed them. So she isn't anyone's favorite right now. Janine needs money because she's fiending bad. They are not using any lab tracks, so you know shit is serious. Ella kicks her out so the kids don't see her when they get home, and she lets Janine know that the rehab is already paid for. Janine does her best to Kimbe Mutombo impersonation. Later that night, the pains are good Christians, so they are at Bible study or a baptism or something. Janine and a couple of dusty derelicts come through and commit a home invasion 
invasion on the house of pain. Pookie says there's a bedroom that smells like feet and Janine knows her baby anywhere. She gets real sentimental looking at pictures of her children while robbing them, but Alabaster tells her not to be weak. They're leaving and Pookie answers a phone call like a receptionist, then robs the phone, not even the mount, an 18 inch CRT, which must have weighed 50 pounds and a bootleg copy of Soul Plane? The pains return home from a long day of good Christianing and Curtis is dismayed to find his TV missing. Ella notices there's something wrong, but she's not sure what. Malik can't find any glasses in the kitchen. They're also missing a lamp, a giant ass picture off the wall, toothbrushes, a pot roast? Nah, they these new Nickelodeon's different. Ella reveals that Janine came by earlier and Curtis is convinced that she's behind it. The Soul Plane DVD is gone, so, and I quote, only a crackhead would steal that movie. Curtis, Calvin, and CJ come down to the little shop of smoker. Calvin steals a Rubik's Cube and they find all their stuff, even the pot roast. Alabaster and Pookie walk in and they scold them for trying to commit black on black crime. Alabaster recognizes is Curtis and Calvin and they just really gloss over that and don't acknowledge it at all. Janine walks in and everyone takes turn roasting her. Calvin's super cool with the inebriates so he's gonna come back and play Rubik's Cube with them or something later. They return from their adventures and Curtis is ready to press charges. Ella wants her to go to rehab. CJ also wants to get her ass locked up. Calvin tells them that she can get drugs in jail easier than in the streets. Ella has seen this at the youth center time and time again. Curtis is really not trying to hear that he's about to call up and get the crack house raided ella stops him though from calling that cj eventually relents and decides to go back with curtis to try to convince janine to go back to rehab cj walks into the crack house alone and janine wants to know why he keeps popping up he tells her that the kids need a mom but she doesn't feel like a mom anymore She's a drug addict. CJ roasts her for being musty and looking like Elfrey Watered in Holiday Heart. He tries to show her pictures of the kids and she kicks him out of the crack house, which is one of the wildest places to get kicked out of. She clutches to the picture of her children that CJ had dropped. Then she tosses it aside so she can get some Z's. As unlikely as it might seem, this is not the end of the episode. Calvin did the 25K and he's flexing on everyone. He's not even sweating. The girl he ran it with finds a cab receipt and now she's definitely never gonna talk to his ass again. The Janine stuff definitely should have been the end. We begin with Oscar Proud returning home to his loving family. After all that love is over, he notices that Sugar Mama is giving out some love to um Lawrence Fishburne. The jacket he's wearing was actually a gift from Sugar Mama because he forgot his wallet when he tried to buy it. Oscar is now even more concerned than he was five seconds ago. He tells her that she needs to spend her money on herself and she flexes her new outfit on him. I think it's Juneteenth, so they're having a cookout in the backyard. Oscar is over there hating on Sugar Mama and Clarence. He thinks Clarence Clarence has to be a juggalo, my mistake, he said gigolo, and doesn't want to see Sugar Mama end up on welfare due to him. He has a secret strategy and invites Poppy from across the street. He exclusively speaks Spanish and nobody understands what the hell he's talking about. He actually hates Sugar Mama, but her singular linguistics prevent her from being able to tell. If you haven't seen the show, that, that's the joke. She tells him that Clarence is her boyfriend and he is off the moon. He goes to the club and he gets some young thotties in celebration. Back at the barbecue, this man Oscar has never seen a Rodney Scott YouTube video and he burns the hell out of everything. His burns are turning into grad students. Clarence offers to take everyone to the fanciest restaurant in town, his treat. They're all smacking their lips, eating like they ain't never ate before. The bill comes and Clarence somehow forgot his wallet again. Oscar's suspicions only grow hotter. The waiter is ready to beat his ass and Sugar Mama pulls out a fat stack and asks, is that enough? Oscar hires a private eye in order to spy on Sugar Mama, but he needs to keep his secret from Trudy. She of course walks in and scolds all of them. Apparently Shaft over here is just a mall cop. Shaft goes out and while watching her, he gets some pictures of them bungee jumping, skydiving, parasailing, go-karting. He even interviewed some sweet old ladies who Clarence had finessed in the past. Say what you want about the mall cop, but he's pretty good. Right when he's revealing the damning evidence to everybody, Sugar Mama walks in with some astounding news. Next week, her and Clarence are getting married. Everyone is so excited, but Oscar is still hating. Sugar Mama wants everyone involved in the wedding. La Cienega's job is to tell Poppy. 
and she's just like, I'm fairly certain he's all right. Oscar now needs to find a way to tell Sugar Mama. Even Trudy is dumbfounded. Luckily, Sugar Mama walks in and she heard everything. She been knew all that. All the women only wanted him for his money. Oscar asks, what money? Sugar Mama tells him to stay out of grown folks' business. Sugar Mama only has a week before the wedding, so she does a classic Rocky montage. If you know anything about montages, you know that it immediately works and she loses all her extra weight. It's the day of the wedding and Oscar and Trudy are walking in in amazement. This wedding looks like Kim and Kanye's. They even have Smokey Robinson singing at this wedding. Oscar thinks he's just Richie from Family Matters, but he notices that Smokey has green eyes, so it has to be him. Smokey pulls out the 50 racks that Sugar Mama paid him to flex on Oscar's hating ass. He then steals his wife, and Trudy really has a hold, really on. Got a hold on. Wizard Kelly then walks up and gives Sugar Mama's bill to Oscar. $75,000. Bobby walks Sugar Mama down the aisle. Oscar says she got a tummy tuck. Sugar Mama don't like that disrespect. It's time for the matrimony, and when the priest asks if anyone has any objections, Oscar with a mouthful of flowers is silent. But a voice comes. It is Clarence's son. He reveals that he is actually Roscoe of Roscoe's Ribs and French Toast. Wizard Kelly even says that he's the richest man in the country. Oscar realizes he's rich and starts begging to let his mom marry Roscoe now. His son reveals that he has terrible dementia, but amazing game, so he does this all the time. Oscar really starts begging now, and Sugar Mama tells him to have some decorum. Clarence's son gives them a check for everything. Sugar Mama cries tears of a clown. Sugar has been starving herself to fit in her dress, and the first bite she takes in two weeks expands her back to regulation size. She's like those pills you throw in water and then they grow. Poppy tried to holler at Skinny Sugar, but the big one is the one he got. We start today with Michael Kyle taunting his family and asking them to guess what he has tickets to. Junior guesses the vagina monologues, but Michael asks, why would he want to see one of them talk? Already the show has dated itself. In the year of our Lord, 2023, the vagina can now speak English, Spanish, French. This is a good time for me to let a hot take off. Damon Wayans is the funniest Wayans by far. Jay guesses the Barishnikov tickets he promised her, and he says, of course not. It's some courtside tickets to see a rookie LeBron James play his first game in Madison Square Garden. Jay isn't supportive at all, so she shades him and says she hopes he doesn't get the flu. This causes him to go into full March 2020 mode and starts taping up the seals of his windows. Luckily, he had a bunch of duct tape from the last anthrax scare. Michael Kyle begins to meet Ryan LeBron, and it's so good that LeBron became one of the greatest Hoopers ever because this episode about Harold Miner wouldn't hit the same. A pizza guy comes by, and Michael is so paranoid that he just tells him to keep the $30 change and leave the pizza. Jay says, that's ridiculous. Give me a dub back. Right at that moment, the pizza guy coughs in Jay's face without covering his mouth whatsoever, and that's really how a lot of y'all was acting pre-COVID. They're laying in bed and Jay begins to develop a cough. Michael for once is not a paranoid weirdo. Jay low-key even admits she did it because she was salty about Brishnikov. Michael logically locks her in the bathroom and forcibly quarantines her. She starts breaking down the door so he lets her out and runs off like Skeletor. He's unlawfully detaining his wife of years to see an 18-year-old LeBron James, which is a whole new wave of pole jockeying. The next day, Claire and Katie are taking care of their sickly mother. Claire lovingly squeezes her mother some orange juice and Jay is still mad, so she rejects it and says it tastes weird, so she just might have COVID-04. Claire and Katie, being the geniuses they are, decide to take a quick taste right off of a sick person's glass. Katie even grabs all of Jay's nasty ass tissues directly by the inside of the trash can. Michael is downstairs having dreams of trying to bag LeBron. He thinks if he plays hard to get, LeBron will just have to go right up to him. Katie barges in looking like a highlighter talking about she's sick. Michael is not playing that whatsoever so he tells her to take her funky ass oxygen and take it right back upstairs. She wants a hug so he has to hold her off with his foot. Claire walks in about five minutes later with the same damn thing. He runs in on Junior with a pile full of tissues and he's either being dumb or he's criminally horny. Turns out he's counting all the tissues for some reason. He even rubs whatever's in the tissue into his eyes and nose and I'm still not 100% sure what's inside those tissues. Michael just storms out in disgust. Junior must have turned into a concubus 
percent count because now Michael has garlic around his neck. Franklin Aliusha's Mumford walks in wearing a full CDC spacesuit to care for his baby girl Katie. That's real love right there. Franklin tells Michael that he most likely already got it, so he better start counting his blessings. Michael tells him that he has tickets to see LeBron, so miss him with that bull. They give him some nicknames LeBron should probably adopt. The Einstein of the parquet, the Stephen Hawking's of hoops, whatever that means. Franklin asks when he gets sick, can he go see LeBron in his place? Michael says he won't get sick because Franklin's gonna help him. Franklin proceeds to give him some dehydrated panda penis. I'm not even making a joke right now. Apparently it boosts your immune system. I'm not gonna Google that. I'm taking Franklin's word on this. Michael goes from riding LeBron's meat to eating dick in five minutes of screen time. Potentially a new record. Franklin then gives him some yak scat, which where is he sourcing these materials? And was he going to give this to Katie? He then just recommends chicken noodle soup and a hazmat suit. So he's not helpful. Michael, being the questionable quality of husband he is, tosses Jay a cup and some oranges, and he's going to go play in his man cave, Michael Land. Jay's still hating and doesn't support him so she's still trying to get him sick katie starts dying so jay forces michael to take her to the hospital he tries to just drop her off in the waiting room and just give her a cell phone he'd never seen you know dateline or anything she talks about she's scared what a baby the doctor comes out in literally 30 seconds and greets him himself which they don't have nurses or receptions at this hospital the doctor tells him to get a flu shot and he says he has dry panda dingus, so he's good. The doctor then has no idea how to sneeze either and sneezes directly into his hand and touches the door, which Michael touches two seconds later. It always be the ones you're not expecting. Brishnikov apparently sprained his ankle, so it turns out that Michael and Jay actually didn't miss his last performance. Michael got him tickets, so Jay's not as upset now. He's about to go down to the hotel to meet LeBron, and Jay starts calling him a groupie. Very accurate. He starts acting tough in person, but when he gets on TV, he's acting like Blackstreet's back. He then decides to sneeze directly in his hand right before shaking LeBron's. Then he goes out and sits directly connected to all these people courtside. They all must have dough, though, if they're sitting courtside, so it's fine. They got sick time. Over the PA system, they announce. LeBron James cannot play today because he has a sudden case of the flu. The camera people must moonlight as Maury camera dudes because they play the replay of Michael giving LeBron the flu on the Jumbotron. Talk about a sports center not top 10. They all boo him and throw stuff at him. Knicks fans are booing the man that made their team's job of winning easier. Real Knicks behavior. We start today with a knock on the door of Gina's apartment. It's one of the funny Martins. There's a plethora of Martins and most of them really aren't funny at all, but Jerome is definitely one of the funnier ones. He comes in harassing all the women, especially Pam. He keeps calling her junk in the trunk. He's trying to sell him a Jerome teddy bear, or as he calls it, pretty teddy. He comes with all the features, including deep fried hair, and it says all your favorite Jerome phrases. They kick him the hell out, and while he's being escorted out, he asks if he could have a threesome with them. Why did they even let this predator in in the first place? We cut over to Martin's apartment and he's fronting with his friends about how his life ain't falling apart. He talks about how him and Gina are gonna get back together and it ain't nothing. Tommy asks if he has submitted any job applications or gone on any job interviews. And you know, Martin, he starts selling wolf tickets. Tommy offers Martin a job. Q, Tommy, you ain't got no job. If you've seen a show, you understand. Cole offers Martin a job at the airport and Martin is too bougie for manual labor. Gina and Pam walk in and Tommy hits Pam with the deep voice, sup girl. Cole is confused cause he thought Martin and Gina were broke up. Martin explains how they're growing apart to get closer and all the complexities of a relationship. They're pretty complex though. And Cole is a simple dude so he doesn't get it. Gina then walks out and asks Bart if he got a job directly in front of everybody, which is wild disrespectful, but Martin is an asshole, so he needs to be humbled occasionally. Pam has a gift for Martin, a stool so he can sit on it at the unemployment office, but they got chairs there, so I don't really get that one. I thought she was gonna go with a short joke like she usually does. Pam is leaving and Tommy gets up trying to be smooth. His head's shiny like baby oil, but the studio audience is going crazy, so clearly he got game here. Martin starts going through the paper talking about how everything isn't good enough for him. Gina tells him to take his ass down to the unemployment office. He 
tells her he's a high commodity item and they're gonna come calling. And she tells him to just go, man. He's mad delusional still. And still she tries to reason with this unreasonable man. He says there ain't a hot links chance at a cookout that he's gonna go there. Martin is down at the unemployment office dressed like a KGB agent who flashes people. His number is called and Myra is the teller. If you don't know, he went on a double date with her and Stan at some point a couple seasons ago. Martin tries to act Hollywood. Nobody knows who he is and most just look at him like he's a threat to public safety. Michael Irvin over here tells him, man, sit your ass down. One of my favorite lines from Martin. Myra offers him some jobs, but Martin's pride makes him overvalue his skill set. But eventually he ends up in the entertainment business. He works the mic at Hoochie Burger. One of my least favorite jokes in Martin. Martin returns home from his first day of Hoochie Burger and he already quit. Gina tells him he can't be a bum forever and he needs a job today. Martin says he has an image, which is hilarious because he had a radio show, so nobody knows what he looks like. If anything, he has a sound he needs to maintain. Gina then shows him this fat stack of bills. He says he has at least 30 days to pay him and ain't nothing gonna happen. And then the lights get cut off. He never even opened any of these bills. How would he even know what the due date was? How you know what 30 days is? We're at Gina's apartment and she still has belief in Martin. Right at that moment, he crushes all of that belief and barges in dressed like a mail carrier. Martin still couldn't make it through one singular day at a job. He's mad he wasn't promoted to the head mail carrier in the first 24 hours. He has a bag full of his own bills and this dude is under pressure. He owes everybody and he's going through every stage of manic depression. Gina tries to give him some money and Martin says he would rather have his pride and be homeless than take help. Gina says he needs to check his pride at the door. Martin storms out en route to the unemployment office to take the first job he gets offered. Back at the unemployment office, Michael Irvin is still here two days later, so I think he might be a U.S. Air Marshal. Martin then walks up and kicks some dude off his spot and tells Myra, I need a job. She doesn't believe in him because of his repeated history of quitting jobs on the very first day. She, being an undeservedly altruistic black queen, gives him a second chance. She gets him a job as a janitor. Every black dude gotta be a janitor at some point. He has his first paycheck and this man made 77.43. Think the minimum wage in the this time was like three some, if I'm not mistaken. So I think this dude worked like 20 hours, actually. Dog, uh, he didn't work 20 hours. He worked 40 hours and got his taxes taken out. This dude really worked a 40 hour week, probably, or like two weeks. Oh my God. Martin maintains a positive attitude, which to be honest is definitely better than I would have been. Martin then shows why he only makes 77.43 because he damages everything, which I'm guessing is taking out his paycheck. We begin with the worst theme song of any show I've ever seen, and this feels like foreshadowing. The actual show starts off with them breaking the fourth wall in honor of black history. Smokey asks if this is like the Different Strokes episode when Dudley got diddled, and I'd rather do that episode than any episode of this show. Bender from Futurama plays Pops, and it is extremely distracting. That's legit how he sounds 24-7, which I can't see how that doesn't get old. Betty and Dana return home from the salon. It's Pops and Dana's anniversary, and Dana wants to go watch Medea. Pops reveals he got faded and X-rated with um, Holiday from Holiday Heart. And I don't know what to do with that information. There's a terrible 50 cent joke. It's like a bad version of the Soul Plane trailer from the Boondocks. Somehow though, this came out like four months before that episode of Boondocks, so they definitely copied this. Pops talks about how immoral it is that the motion picture industry puts out negative images of black people, especially during Black History Month. At that moment, I had to look into the camera like The Office and consider deleting this review. They continue promoting a bunch of terrible black stereotypes, but luckily this came out in July, not Black History Month, so Pops is good. Bender starts off by telling the story of Crispus Attucks. He was the first person who was killed in the Revolutionary War. He was was a runaway slave and he wasn't even from Boston. He was just stopping through and look what happened. As a Lakers fan, let me take this moment to shit on Boston. Black people got to stay out of Boston. None of this is what Pops is saying. This is what I'm saying. What Pops ends up saying is that addicts went from Kunta to a gentleman, then some racist white dude threw a snowball and blamed Crispus. And then, you know, Revolutionary War. Craig calls him crispy and asks if he was in the riots, so his bum ass wasn't listening. Pops says we need to learn more than Martin Luther King got shot and Smokey didn't even 
even know that much. So, fr- funny jokes, you know. They're going somewhere listening to Roots on tape, and that's the funniest thing that's happened, which I hate that I just had to say that sentence. They pull up to Burger Shack's Black History Month Fair Pavilion. Pop says it has all black history from shackles to shav. So, I mean, that's basically what they taught us in school, you know, 1492-ish to 1971-ish. Sorry, I, I gotta try out some material. This show is not funny. I gotta try something. This random caricature walks up and tells them that Oprah's best friend Gail is coming through and Pinky starts trying to plot on her. The writing of this show is just so bad and disjointed and fast paced. They feel like one of my videos for 20 minutes and somehow my videos feel like they have a higher budget, but they don't, let me tell you that. They have Phil Lamar and Cree Summers and Bender and Aqualad from Young Justice. I am simply one singular flame emoji. Somehow Bender is the only man upset with all the shucking and jiving. And it's really weird being on his side. For some reason, he's the main character of this show. Bender's trying to wake everyone up to do black history, but he can only get Craig and Smokey, who is in his own house, so Pops had to break in for it. He tells the story of Grandpa Ephraim, and Craig describes him as someone who makes waitresses go in his pocket for tips. They go back to civil rights time, and Ephraim joins the NAACP to holler at women. He starts trying to bag Rosa Parks, and he says he wants to get hoes down together, then take their clothes off. She runs away. He talks to her with dog feces on his boots. I'm about to run away. This is the worst anything I've ever seen. Rosa Parks ends up getting arrested because she wouldn't sit next to Ephraim. Pops explains, think about it. Because your grandfather was constantly spitting weak ass game, we're able to live in a society that treats all people on a level playing field, except when they need a loan, education, or hurricane relief. He forgot to include quality entertainment. Craig gets it now. History is living. Past may seem far back, but in reality, we're experiencing history. They don't say it like that, but somebody has to make this video cohesive. They go to the museum and it's March 1st. It's not Black History Month, whatever. Zero in every category. I don't even usually add a score. This is my first score. You can note that. Zero. We start today at the Dakota Hills Mall. These hoodlums are running everyone's pockets and Static pulls up and violently slaughters all of them. The bird lady's still alive apparently, so he just gets her locked up. Static's father, Mr. Hawkin, is watching the brouhaha on television and thinks Static is too cocky. Sharon walks up and says Richie is a bum and needs to pay rent because he stay at their house. Static and Richie are upstairs talking gadget and Static realizes that Sharon was right. They've literally never been to Richie's house. Richie gets all nervous and he says, it's just better over here. After getting pressed, Richie blurts out, fine, we'll just go over on Friday. It turns out that Static sucks at killing, so everyone's actually alive and fine. They're mad though. Uh, They're gonna kill Static or something, you know, basic villain stuff. Virgil and Richie are playing in Richie's room and it's sweet. Static is low-key mad that he acted like he didn't have anything just so he could come over and waste all his electricity and eat his food. Richie's mom comes in and tells them that they're gonna have dinner soon. Right at that moment, Richie's dad comes home slamming the door. Virgil comes out to greet him because he always wanted to meet Mr. Foley, but Mr. Foley does not share the same sentiment. Richie chalks it up to a rough day at work and Virgil just accepts that and he's gonna go and get ready for dinner. At the table, it's quieter than Chernobyl and just as toxic. Virgil says he brought some rap and Richie's dad acts like he just put a crack pipe on a table. He says rap teaches kids to disrespect their parents and write on walls and stay out after curfew and wear velvet do-rags and listen to music on the bus over their phones speakers. It destroys everything guys like him built. Richie says he's embarrassed of his dad's prejudice and Virgil tells him it's all good. It isn't a black white thing. It's an old thing. While going to brush his teeth, he overhears Richie's dad say, and I quote, Now I see why Richie acts like the hood. That kid's a bad influence. All his kind are. It's bad enough I have to deal with him all day long. Now one of them is in my house? Static immediately dips out and he tells Richie that you just can't put the neck bones in the green now. It's too damn late. Richie storms upstairs and tells his clansman father that he hates him. Static is back home and he's staring out of a window
window sighing, so you know shit is real. His dad comes and checks on him, and Virgil wants to know how can someone like that be Richie's father? Mr. Hawkins tells him that Richie's dad doesn't even know himself, and at least Richie has broken his father's cycle of intolerance. Static tries to get a stereo off the sympathy, but his dad says he doesn't like rap. Doesn't say anything racist, so I'm not sure if it's just a whole thing anymore. Static gets a call from Richie's mom. He hasn't been home all night. Richie's dad is drinking in anger. You could tell by his handshake. She tries to apologize to Static, but he cuts her off. He don't want to hear that. Richie is walking up the street in the snow and starts getting harassed by some zoo animals. Baltimore is rough. He manages to evade them by climbing a ladder. You know, they don't have opposable thumbs, so they can't climb. Mr. Foley goes to visit Mr. Hawkins in search of Richie. He's trying to act all self-righteous about how nobody could tell him about his parenting abilities. Virgil's dad then asked him, hey, do you know any of Richie's friends or where he hangs out? Richie then tells him how he doesn't know anything about his son, not even that his friends are. Virgil Dad corrects him right there. African American. He then proceeds to try to storm out because it's just a waste of his time. His pride would allow him to let Richie freeze to death rather than get some help from a black dude. Virgil's dad basically forces him to act like an adult and go look for his son. Static is on the look for Richie and he finds him over their communication system. Richie says that he can't forgive his father and Static should be madder than him. Don't tell black people how mad they should be about racism, but his heart is in the right place. Virgil cheers him up, but this shadowy figure Ebon is lurking. Static hears him Sirens and he goes to assist, and Shadow Man kidnaps Richie. Virgil's dad takes Richie's dad to a drug den. Mr. Hawkins is trying to help all of them, and Mr. Foley is being judgmental. Hawkins tells him that a lot of these kids' home lives are so rough that they would rather be homeless than live with their asshole parents. Mr. Foley says, like Richie, somehow Virgil's dad doesn't go, duh. Some young ne'er do well directs them to an abandoned building, and they don't see the setup for the wet upcoming. Ebon is back at the villain's lair, and he is trying to trade Richie for Bird Lady. Bird Lady's in police lockup, so what is the plan here? Ebon doesn't have a nose, so he can't sniff out the bullshit. Richie keeps pressing the walkie-talkie in his back pocket while yelling the location. Did nobody search this dude? Downstairs, I think Mr. Foley's brain alternator is dead, so the jump start didn't work earlier. He's still blaming the world around him for his problems. Mr. Hawkins checks him, and I quote, I know you're kind, Foley. I've seen your kind all my life. A fine, upstanding bigot. His nose so close to the grindstone, he can't see anything else. Meanwhile, the world changes and grows, and he's blind to it. Ignorant and proud of it. Richie's father is mad at reality. If you think TV is too woke now, I want you to go back and actually watch the old shows you praise, because they probably talking about y'all. Ebon finally notices Richie has a wire and snatches his ass up. Richie yells out, and the fathers hear it. They run upstairs and Mr. Richie sees this black dude manhandling his son, so that's not gonna help things. The fathers try to fight the supervillains and get their ass whooped like you would expect. Luckily, Static shows up and shocks everyone. That works until Ebon starts stomping his ass out. Richie's dad tries to save a black man and he gets a backhand for it. The shocking works better the second time. Richie checks in on his dad and I think he's concussed because the racism is gone. Apologize to Richie and embraces him. So the kids you right here. Mr. Hawkin asks if Static's parents know where he is, so he skedaddles out. The next day, Static and Richie are going to Dakota Comic Con, and Mr. Foley is their chaperone. Static tries to tell him about cosplay, and Richie stops him. He wants to see his dad be surprised at all the men in makeup. I guess one bigotry at a time. We begin today with the game of intergender football. The girls really lack any type of line presence, so Darren Bates over here sacks the QB off the opening snap. They're getting their misogyny on, and DeJanae decides that this is the moment to put her filthy-ass hands in Sticky's filthy-ass mouth. The girls are down by three, and it's the last play of the game. This random triangle is talking cash shit, so they bet some ice cream on it. In the huddle, the dark-skinned girls are blue, and that isn't relevant, but it's definitely relevant. Penny lays out the play. The ball is going to her. They start off with a hold on the line, so this is essentially a dead play. Triangle is a DB with a flat top, so you just know he about to get snagged on. Penny even hits her gritty into the end zone, which is crazy. This is why misogyny is risky, because if she mossy 
your ass, you're going to look really bad. The next day at school, the football team is practicing punt returns or something because what the hell are they lined up in? Cheerleaders tragically suffer a terrible double inverse pyramid accident? A couple of them might have died, it looks like. Penny and Zoe are witnesses to this tragedy, tragically. Luckily, they get over it fast and they start talking about the upcoming dance. The football team is trash, so they almost hit this random group 50 yards away from play. Penny snags this shit with one hand? She might be a generational talent, Loki. The triangle starts trying to spit trash game, then gets mad when Penny talks about how she sunned him yesterday. He says if he could have hit her ass, then it would have been a different story, which is cat because this dude wasn't even close to hitting her. Zoe starts Loki talking for Penny and starts saying she will ball all y'all up. The football team responds by throwing footballs at him. He's such a man, he has to run to back up. Penny says she don't fear nothing but God and everybody on the field getting cleaned up. Penny comes home attempting to get a permission slip signed to join the football team. Oscar is mad, but Penny tells him none of these little dudes can even catch her. So how could she get hurt? Oscar does not approve. Women cannot play men's sports. They don't know how to handle the pain. Trudy asks, what about childbirth? And that's one of those lines women got that really doesn't have a response yet. Trudy tells Penny that she'll sign the permission slip. The next day, football practice all the boys are shocked as eels orgasming to see penny on the field all padded up coach calls everyone up to give him their permission slips and when penny tries he tells her that cheerleading trials are over there she tells him that she's here to try out for football he tells her sure baby doll you tried penny then informs him that there's no rule that says that she can't play football but there's plenty of them about calling her baby doll he then hits her with a little bit more misogyny and then tells her to go home and bake a cake these eight girls come out of nowhere and start chanting let penny play like seven times and it has worn down the coach he tells her to get out there but if she get hers that's on you chump bailey is lined up in press coverage talking about how locked down he is she kills him off the line and catches a deep ball over top for a touchdown the coach can't believe that he can't even handle a girl he says run that shit back he makes sure to start off with a headbutt that'll get you kicked out the league after assaulting this girl eight inches shorter than him because he he can't guard her everyone is cheering about how strong and masculine he is then she just gets up and runs past his ass anyways because nobody's paying attention goofy ass the coach is announcing the cuts for the team everyone made a team that is everyone besides the girl they make sure to highlight even the gay kid made it over her so if you think about it technically it's kind of progressive the coach makes sure to say no girl will ever play for his team this 270 degree shape proceeds to say girls really can't compete with boys in football when he's the main one getting cooked he then immediately one sentence later tries to ask her out a lot of y'all be acting like this as grown-ass adults don't do this penny is home complaining about how none of them boys could even lace up her cleats but Oscar is pretty happy that Penny's dreams are dead. Luckily, at that moment, Zoe walks in with the lawyer. She says they're going to sue the chauvinistic pigs off that hillbilly coach. I definitely thought they were going to say sue the shit out of them. Gloria Cochran, played by We the People with Gloria Alred, is about to get kicked out because Oscar doesn't want to pay for something that he doesn't even believe in. She says she'll just do it for clout. Judge Maybelline Ephraim from Divorce Court is here, and I actually typed up that joke before I realized it's literally Maybelline Ephraim from Divorce Court. I be watching too much daytime tv the football team is just as ass in the court as they were on the field so they take another l penny is now the global face of women's football at their next game a whole new set of cheerleaders perish tragically penny don't have any place on the field she don't even have a place on the bench the coach is not gonna play her so the crowd starts up another chant he's grown more resistant to repeated words so he still ain't putting her in coach said the court says she had to be on a team but you can't litigate for play play boy play girl in this sense Due to injuries, the coach is ready to send in the water boy, who is apparently his son, but he's literally shook. It's Penny's time to shine, and the crowd is ecstatic. The coach gives her the play. Drag 29 to triangle. In the huddle, the team is surprised to see Penny running up. She tells them to play. Drag 29 to the best receiver out here, me. She runs the streak, so I don't know if she actually studied the playbook. She don't do the drag whatsoever. But she still manages to get flattened by the Oakland Raiders. Not a soul block for her. Hush grows over the crowd. Penny might be dead. At that moment, she climbs out the hole and she tells them to give her the ball if y'all want to win. The isosceles is isolated in his hate and 
Everyone is telling him that he's trash and we're giving the ball to Penny. She goes out and does everything. She's mossing defenders and stiff arming haters on offense. She even gets a pick six and kicks an extra point. This is one of the greatest single game performances of all time. They show her scoring like seven touchdowns, but somehow they're down by five coming into the last play. The triangle is still acting like a square and he wants to circle. Penny even says give his sorry ass the ball. They step up for the snap and this dude Omar has amazing pocket presence. He makes his first read, triangle. He's doubled. He makes his second read, Penny. She's wide open. Under more heat than a buffet warmer, Omar manages to get the ball in the air. The pass has a little bit too much air in it though, so Penny has to make a dive. She has the ball in her fingertips, but she's not wearing gloves. She can't manage to tuck in her elbows, so when she hits the ground, the pass falls incomplete. Penny goes from balling to balling, and she has to be carried off the field. It's time for the homecoming dance. La Cienega is roasting Penny for her butterfingers, and Penny is down. Oscar is her chaperone slash date, and he's trying his best to cheer her back up. Everyone starts giving Penny love for being the only person who scored. Not even one, like seven of them things. The triangle truly becomes half a square this day because he apologizes for hating and asks if he can get a dance. Penny is still in middle school, so she falls for that BS. We begin today with just Jordan and his two friends whose names I forget. They're sitting around and wondering what girls talk about. I can tell you what they're not talking about and it's these dweebs. The frailest of the bunch decides to go up and holler at one of the girls with the common hat on. He ends up blurbing out nose bubbles, which is childish. They're snot feeling that. Now the one with the large cranium puts on his basketball jersey and goes up to spit game. What's up ladies? Tony from the basketball team. His name is Tony. Tony's game is is phony and now his ass is lonely. They throw a rock at him, but that doesn't explain why his head was already swollen. It looks like these LA girls need a little country charm, so just Jordan hastily goes to the ladies. He bumps into this convict, and I'm not trying to stereotype my man, but he has a tank top as a do-rag, and that's definitely some jail shit. All the girls love thugs, so they come flocking to him, which is every parolee's dream. They ask him if they can get a ride in his car, and he says, nah, but y'all can wash it. This man's name is Crusher. They tell Crusher it's the 21st century, so they're not washing your dirty ass car. But they'll pay to get it washed. Crusher walked in 48 seconds ago, and he's leaving with with four girls in a car wash? What a legend. Jordan disassociates just to hate. The lonely brothers are sitting around looking dejected like slinkies. They ask Tangi how to get girls and she asks if they've ever stopped to think if it's not the girls, it's them. She makes some very valid points. They're a little delusional so they say she's wrong and we just need to get shit bracket if we want to get women. They get a new wardrobe for their day at Ronald Reagan High. Just Jordan is dressed like if Dub C joined the military. Tony's dressed like he's from Grove. Street. The frail one's dressed like every other day, so I'ma let the fact that he wears this to school and not his job as a bank teller be the joke. Next step in being thugs, they need new thug nicknames. Just Jordan is now j Dog. Tony is Casper. The Mexican homie is named Joaquin, and he's gonna go by Osmondo, which is his felon uncle's name. Osmondo definitely has the best name out of this trio. They run into Tangi, and she tells him that triple XLTs don't make you down. You gotta actually get put on if you want these girls. They decide to stage a robbery on the most pathetic person they know, and they're just gonna try it on my boy Osmondo? Not cool. Just commits a strong arm robbery on camera and posts the evidence on the internet for all to see so he's tripping how is this gonna get tony or osmondo any girls they're hustling backwards all the girls love just jordan now and he's smoking with cigarettes they must be dipped in embalming fluid though because just jordan starts disassociating again this girl that's been ducking him for the longest comes up and asks if he wants to be her date to the carnival tony's head looks much smaller now that his hair is held down by this rag so maybe it was just a bowl cut thug jordan comes in the restaurant false flagging and his grand daddy been from the block since the 80s so he g-checks j-dog the police come in with osmondo and jordan realizes his street ways are catching up to him turns out it's joaquin's dad and he knows the video is fake as hell so just jordan is bust jordan he's grounded for a month just jordan gets a call on his sidekick Dwayne wade lx bape edition 3 it's tamika from earlier she's wondering where he is now he's lust jordan so jordan must climb out the window which doesn't have bars so he must live in a good part of la jordan arrives at the carnival and continues to perpetrate a fraud. Back at the restaurant, Jordan's OG 
Siege, uh, Andrew Bynum face, and his mom are talking about Jordan. He feels she's being too harsh because Jordan's growing up and he's gonna make mistakes. If only she would just trust Jordan. She's going upstairs to talk to him about it. Back at the carnival, Jordan is acting an absolute ass. He's about to snap his legs in this bumper cart. He won a carnival game and he decides to get himself the prize, a uh, angry Donkey Kong not licensed by Nintendo. He even has Tamika feeding him. Right at that moment, Sticky Fingers, G Herbo cousin, and Joaquin Uncle Osmondo come to Jux Jordan. His mom walks up and saves him from getting jumped on a date, which will guarantee you never get a second date. Turns out Crusher is actually Eugene Jr. Lame ass. Jordan is now on punishment for two months for a parole violation. Tamika is not feeling Jordan, and as soon as he turns around, she dips out. The next day, Jordan is at work, and Tamika walks in and dubs him. Jordan must be dusting dusted because he starts astral projecting with his eyes open for the third time this episode. This dude might have a problem. He tells himself that he ain't talking to her never ever again. She comes back just to tell him. She would never fall for that weak ass game like that again. It's not exciting to be treated badly and she would never let that happen twice. Jordan tries some good guy shtick and she puts a hand on her shoulder and just says no, which is hilarious.